All right, so tell me a great story. So, Steve, you were asking me about my approach to kind of business and life. Well, I was thinking about this the other day, and, and actually it came up with my daughter. We were talking about a trip we got coming up to Utah. And two years ago, right before COVID hit, and this is kind of, let me step back and say, this is kind of how I approach life and business, which is kind of a step-by-step -step method. So my daughter and I take a trip two years ago to Zion National Park. Day one, she wants to go hiking. I, and I'm like, I want to get settled in a little bit, but she's ambitious. So we, right near the park entrance, there's a, there's a trail called Watchman's Trail. And you look up at this rock cliff, and it's, I don't know, it's 800, 1,000 feet tall. And you can see up there, and you can see tiny little people up there. But I'm looking at her, and I'm like, baby, there's no way you can get up there. I, I don't see a trail. I don't see how to do it. And she's like, come on, Dad. So we start on down the trail. And lo and behold, a little bit more gets revealed. And a little bit more gets revealed. A little bit more revealed. Next no, we're at the top. And I think that's kind of looking back on that story or my daughter's. Wow. That, yeah, it's, you know, I think too many people look at a, the mountain or where they want to be and think it's just too hard to get there. They don't see how to get there. And I think my whole life, I say my whole life, I think because there's been opportunity that's opened in front of me and I've just kind of stepped through that door and I've stepped through that door and I've just taken it a step at a time. I've never looked at it something overwhelming. So you just piece, you know, it's like as we go down this trail, as we go down this journey, it just gets, it, things become more clear and you get closer to your destination. Exactly. You know, you, you, you can see the vision, you can see where you want to go, but you, you know, you just can't you can't skyrocket there. Yeah. You got to go a step at a time. And I think yeah. that's where too many people probably go wrong in life and in business. They just, they want to skyrocket immediately. That's awesome. So, hey everybody, welcome to another Beach Talk. I've got my friend Matt Fultz here. We know each other all the way back from high school. And he's got champion physical therapy. You can see it right here on his shirt. And uh, his uh, first office was up in uh, Cumming, Georgia, and you got how many, you got? I got Alfred, another one in Alpharetta. You got an Alpharetta location, and so he's kind of one of the go-to guys in the area if you've got physical therapy needs. And so we're gonna we're gonna get into that. And he's also a successful business person, so I want to ask him some stuff on his approach on business. We just learned a little bit of that, but before we get the podcast going, we're gonna talk about whiskey. So today I brought a bottle of Boondocks bourbon. Somebody gave me this bourbon and said, man, you need to try this. This is really good. So I poured Matt and I a, a little taste of it. And Boondocks is eight years old. So they don't make their own whiskey. They actually source whiskey from other people. But the guy that runs this thing that's kind of in charge is, uh, I think his name's Dave. He's kind of the master distiller. And he's won all kind of awards for for bourbon stuff. He's in some big like Hall of Fame thing. So he's a, he knows what the hell he's doing. And so what he did with this bourbon is he took this eight year old bourbon and he put it into port barrels. And so a lot of people don't know port, you know, is, is a higher alcohol content wine. So they, you know, regular wine's probably 12%, port wine's probably 20%. That's why you only drink a little bit of it. And it's pretty mm -hmm. strong and it's like a dessert wine or whatever. But a lot of bourbons and uh, uh, scotch like to go into port barrels. They like the way that it finishes off the whiskey. So we think this is probably pretty damn smooth. What do you think? Ah, oh, it's very smooth. It's very mm. smooth. I think it's very probably smooth. about a forty-five, fifty-dollar bottle. So if you're looking for something really cool, something different to try, it's called Boondocks because most of the, you know, good distilleries back in the day were way out in the Boondocks because <clears throat> they were around the farms and stuff like that. But look that up. That's pretty good whiskey. So, Matt, um, what do you think you do differently? <clears throat> than other people that are in the physical therapy business. Do you feel like your company, you've got something that's unique about how you approach it or something? Or, Well, I think we do. I, um, I think first and foremost, it's, it's the culture we build at our facility. Um, you know, there's tons of physical therapists and there's tons of great physical therapists. I mean, there's tons that are the best of the best. 
And you know, we're we're good, we're great physical therapists. We're not the best in the world, but. People come to us and we have a culture there that, first of all, it's family oriented, family culture, private mm-hmm. practice. You know, we're going to treat you as if you're, you know, mom or dad, you know, brother, sister. Um, and we're going to build that trust. And I think that's what people these days, more than anything in any business, yeah. want to have trust. And when they have that trust, they also are going to know that they're going to get better. And I mm-hmm. think that's the hardest part in any medical capacity is people want to get better yesterday <laughs> and they have to trust the process. And sometimes there's a buy into that and they have to know that that's where we're going to get them to. So how do you get people to trust you? I think it's that relationship you build. It's yeah. uh, people come in, we're going to know that you care. Uh, no, you care. We're going to, we're going to listen to their needs. Uh, we're not going to just kind of, kind of, you know, fly over them with their needs. We're going to listen to them. We're going to develop that relationship. And I tell, when I get interns, I tell them, this is the, you know, 90% of your treatment is going to be how you get people to trust you in your relationship. Once you foster that relationship with them, they're going to trust what you have to say and they're going to trust what you tell them to do. Because in our business, the hardest part is to get people to do at home what you want them to do. So it's not only what they're doing when they come in and work with the therapist, it's also what they do when they're not with the therapist. Yeah, they're with us for an hour, hour and a half. Outside that, they've got the other seven days a week plus 20, or six days a week plus 23 hours. So it's what they do there that makes the biggest, you know, oh. yeah. So I say six, they may come in twice a week, mm-hmm. but, but needless to say, they're only seeing us a couple times a week. So we need them to, to know that what we're doing in the clinic, we need them doing things outside of that as well. Some of that may be certain exercises. Some of it may be just being careful of what they do. So let's talk about that because I think that I think there's a lot of people that are have different ailments, and I'm sure you get that right. You're somewhere, and I go, "Hey, man, my wrist hurts," or whatever, you know. So I want to go through some of the body parts and some of the things. And I'm gonna start with my my problem. And which I came to you for was the needling. Do you call it dry needling? De- yeah. What do you call dry it? Dry needling. Dry needling. <clears throat> so tell me about dry needling because that's fairly somewhat new to the therapist business. Where is it good? Where, who's it help? Who does it not help? What's your What's your opinion of? Uh, well, it'll help just about anybody. So the way I am trained, I myself and some of my my colleagues that work alongside me, we're trained through a gentleman out in Colorado who is traditionally an acupuncturist, but he came to the States and started researching, which is kind of frowned upon in Chinese medicine. You know, you just take Chinese medicine for what it's worth. So he came here to start researching the effects of needling. And he found out that, and I'll kind of abbreviate this, but by dry needling or by needling certain points of the body, that it triggers a response in your body that helps your body to go into homeostasis, meaning your body's going to regulate its metabolic systems, meaning digestion, anxiety, pain, anything. We know now that's really how acupuncture works, is that it's that effect, not meridians, not chi. I mean, that's what they call it, but it is a true physiological response. So acupuncture does work in the respect of certain points of the body that triggers that response. So when I say it works for anybody, I can get a patient in that has you know, sickness from chemotherapy and we can needle these certain parts of these areas and they'll just in general feel better. Really? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it, so what is it doing when you need it? What's the, what's the reaction the body's have? There, so there's a part of the brain that gets, that's gets stimulated. And that's what Dr. Ma saw on MRI studies before and after needling is that the, the needles promote this triggering of the brain to then release certain physiological response or certain, I wouldn't call them hormones, but there's like these different cytokines and proteins that, that start a communication process with the body to have the body to want to heal itself. Heal itself. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a unique it's, kind of thing. I, I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> I, back in 2010, I thought it was a bunch of literally voodoo nonsense. Right. And one of my clinicians wanted to get certified and I said, well, okay. And I paid for half of his tuition and he came back and I had a pain in my back that I really couldn't get rid of. I should be able to, but I couldn't. He did it one time 
and the pain was gone. So I ate a lot of crow. <laughs> I paid his other half his tuition. <laughs> and since then, I've probably invested about thirty grand in getting most of my clinicians certified. Now, that's a portion of it that he teaches. Universities don't really go into that. So at Emory and Mercer and these universities that are teaching dry needling now, they don't talk about that part of it. So they talk more about trigger point release in muscles, uh, tendon healing with the needle and that kind of stuff, which is a whole different part so who, of it. So who have you seen that benefits the most? If somebody's got X, you feel like pretty strongly this will help. It really works well with necks and backs. So if you come to me and you've got some neck pain or back pain and you've got, uh, and I palpate and I was like, wow, you've really got some locked up muscle here. Those needles have an uncanny way of causing those muscles to ultimately relax. And for most people, they have their kind of their main source of pain, whether it be a disc pain or uh, uh, facet, which is, a, which is part of the bone, where the bones articulate with bones in the back. Facet pain, that's kind of your initial source. And then muscle spasm and tense up due to that initial source. As we all know, cramped muscles, if you're at a calf cramp or a foot cramp, you can't walk around. It hurts so bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen the football players laying on the ground. They can't get up because they're cramping so bad. That's essentially what it is. You get these back muscles that are spasmed, and it hurts. In fact, it hurts so bad, sometimes people can't even move. So they're so tight, and then this has a way of releasing. Relaxing that, and that helps kind of get rid of that part of it. Now, that it may take once. It may take multiple times of dry nailing. And I have, I have some patients that come in every so often just for that They're like i need a tune-up matt that's awesome all right yeah. now it looks to me like the orthopedic surgeon biz orthopedic surgeons have had the just um it's been a blessing to them with the new knees and new hips i mean they they're they're really everybody's kind of into that so you go get your new knee you go get your new hip the next thing they do is they come see you right so what what are you learning about new knees and new hips? What's is it? It's helping most people. Is it helping them with their pain? Is the process of getting well? Is it? Have y'all figuring out how to make that really work? Because it's been going on for a little bit now. Yeah. Well, they're having the new total hips and total knees and even total shoulders. You know, it seems like every shoulders. yeah they do total shoulders as well. Um, they. Uh, you know, every couple of years, they seem to come out with new components, new and better components. Um, some of the doctors are, have even done some robotics, where the robotics help to make the cuts. Uh, but it's a very, you know, it's a very precision type of uh, surgery. You got to get those components in just right. As far as the therapy, from our standpoint, it's actually not that. It's it's pretty easy. All our, our goal is is to, in, a, in the case of a knee, get their knee moving, get it straight, get it bent get their muscle tone back, and then we're done. Now, there are cases where people go into surgery where they are so deconditioned muscle-wise, or they may go in with their knee already like bent at a, like they can't straighten it out, and it's been that way for years and years and years. They'll go in, they'll get that total knee, and in, in surgery, then the surgeons, he'll get it all the way straight, he'll get it all the way bent, no problem. But the human brain, when they start back to therapy, uh, the human brain, the muscle memory take, takes that knee right back to where it was. And sometimes it's a struggle in therapy. We have to stay on that throttle to, to wow. get that knee straight. And, and sometimes that's our difficult part is kind of overcoming that, that nasty brain muscle memory. So how, how does a person know they need a knee or hip? Patients often ask me, when do I, yeah, with that question. And I tell them, this is kind of my standard. Now, this may be an extreme, but I say, let's say you're a huge Braves fan. All right, you're just mm -hmm. a diehard Braves fan. And someone comes to you and says, man, I got four tickets and a limo, and you're going to be in a box seat. At the, all you can eat, all you can drink, right behind home plate. Here you go. And, you're, and you say to them, ah, oh, man, I'd love to, but my dad gum knee just hurts. I just can't. I, can't, I got to turn it down. When you start that kind of behavior and you're giving up on things that you enjoy in life, it's time. That's awesome. Okay, what about sprained ankles? What do you do with sprained ankles? <laughs> Basketball players, tennis players. Well, 
usually with sprained ankles or any sprained ligament, there comes a time of healing where you want that, that ligament to, it depends on the severity of it, you want the ligament to, to kind of heal up or scar down. So you'll see some people in bad ankle sprains being a walking boot. They can still come to therapy and we can work on strengthening so we don't lose, you know, lose some of their strength around their ankle. But we've got to do that strengthening in a way that we don't put stress on that tendon or the ligament that's that's healing. Mm. So we have to make sure that the collagen lays down in a way, in a functional way that, that it'll heal right that six weeks, eight weeks down the road, they'll be able to get back into sport and not have any problems. So uh, it's about strengthening the muscles and not the and, and not messing with the ligament so the ligament can Yeah, we don't want to put any stress on the ligament. So we're not gonna we're not gonna do any strengthening that that stretches that ligament out. I mean I know that's kind of a, it's kinda of hard to explain without having a little ankle model here, but um, other things we might do are what we call proprioceptive exercises where we'll have them because when they when they sprain this ligament they lose the ability to have a connection between a, a vital connection between their, their ankle and their brain which helps them balance. So we, we will do things to help them challenge their balance systems to kind of reconnect that. I tell patients all the time when you sprain an ankle or you're, you sprain your knee, it's like sticking a light uh, a fork in a socket. You're like short-circuiting the system and things get a little bit haywire. Muscles atrophy, your balance systems get a little bit messed up. So those are the things we want to kind of jump on board as quick as we can while that ligament's kind of healing. So what about shoulders? What do you see with people on shoulders? What, what are we seeing? Most of young people is... Uh, well, most young people, like baseball players, it might be shoulder instability. So where the shoulder sits in its socket, that you might have an injury where the shoulder wants to pop out and it damages part of the, the, the what's called labrum of the shoulder. And so those young athletes are typically ones we see that have surgery. Older folks like Isn't us. Is that rotator cuff surgery? So, well, no, that, that, so what they'll do is that's they'll go, that, so that's labrum surgery. Old, rarely does a young person tear their rotator cuff. Usually it's small, repetitive problems over time. Then they get to be us. Right. Then they tear your rotator cuff. So now you go out and you start playing, hey, I'm going to throw a fastball to you. You, just, you get down there and you tear your rotator cuff. And then that's when they go in and have to anchor it back down, the, or the tendons of the rotator cuff back down to the bone. And then you come see me for the reparative process. And then what, what happens in that? What are we doing new and cool in that business? Um, well, most of that is, it's kind of been the same thing. It's The first six weeks is a healing process. The next six weeks, six weeks to 12 weeks is a, I call it a collagen modeling process where uh -huh. those collagen fibers, we're going to make stronger and stronger over time. And then from 12 weeks on, we're going to strengthen your rotator cuff and get you back to playing golf throwing or whatever you want to do. Now, in our facility, it doesn't necessarily, it will, it will speed up the process, but we don't use it as a speed up process. We have a, hyper, a mild hyperbaric chamber in our facility. So if a patient is not claustrophobic, they can get in this thing, puts their body under pressure. The oxygen they're breathing is also is put under pressure. pressure. So you're breathing compressed oxygen molecules. So your whole body gets enriched with oxygen which helps the healing process so i won't ever tell an athlete or i'll tell a doctor hey i can we'll have your athlete back on the field in eight weeks versus 16 weeks even though it will help the healing process but we're still not gonna rush that we're still gonna kind of go but oh, oxygen helps the oh healing yeah process. that's yeah. all the healing process yeah that's why the, the less oxygen you get to tissue the harder it is to heal that's interesting okay so you've got this, you've got the, what's this chamber look like? I mean, is it? It looks like a big Tylenol. A big Tylenol. <laughs> and a lot of pro athletes, they have them in their homes. A lot of them have them in their homes. They'll use them post, you know, they'll go. Are they expensive? Uh, they're about 30,000 brand new. Okay. Well, that's nothing we got a couple million dollars. That's right. Of. You just get one and you put it in the, <laughs> put it in the closet. But um, it's, yeah, it looks like a big Tylenol and you get in it. And it zip it has a double zipper and it seals and it you hit the button and it starts filling up with air and it'll get to about four point three pounds per square inch in there. You have to pressurize your ears just like you're going underwater. And then once you get pressurized, you put a little oxygen mask on, which kinda 
machine outside bumps up your oxygen content to about 60% oxygen. And as the oxygen enters the chamber, it also gets put under pressure. And they get shrunk down, pretty much like a scuba diver does. When a scuba diver goes, excuse me, when a scuba diver, scuba diver goes underwater, they're breathing compressed air. Right. And that's the same thing that goes on there. So your, high, your hemoglobin gets saturated maximally. And then those compressed oxygen molecules then saturate to all your tissue. Uh, it's it, it is it's a great. It's, it is a great device. We use it for concussions. I mean, the hyperbaric community they'll say it helps with anti aging, cancer, all kinds of stuff. I have pamphlets for all that stuff. I mean, I'm not going to go around telling somebody they're going to look younger. Now, if I could, <laughs> I may just get out of the therapy. <laughs> we might business. start doing that. We might just start doing it, but. You know, we, we'll use it with athletes, and I'll get, and I've had some post-COVID people get in it. I have doctors, so these, these long haulers disorders, mm -hmm. doctors send over some post-COVID people, and we get them in there, we'll bump up their oxygen content or all their tissue, and then we get them out and we work them out, large muscle groups, and we give them some biofeedback to watch their oxygen levels while they're working out, and it's crazy how it works. These so people, it's helping them? Oh, yeah. We've had great long results. Long COVID. It's called long haulers. Long, yeah. It's a long haulers disorder, and we were seeing not a lot of cases, but um, we saw a fair amount. Some of them were young people too, athletes, and we had uh, you know had soccer trouts coming up. They could barely they could barely stretch out, and they were winded. And we got them going. It's That's crazy, it. yeah. Um, all right, so where when do you put ice on something, and when do you put heat on something? General rule of thumb is. If you have a, like going back to the sprained ankle, you sprain your ankle, we want to eliminate as much swelling as possible. We want to, we don't, because swelling has a way of, of decreasing the ability of healing. Um, there's another treatment, I'll, I'll kind of, I'm going to go back to, I'll come back to this, but there's another treatment called cupping therapy. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah. That is also an oriental type of medicine. We were also, we were also kind of, I wouldn't say we were, we were educated in it. We learned about cupping when we did our, did our dry needling certification. And one of the approaches Dr. Ma has taken on this, and he has, he's still doing research on it, is he believes that when you have an injury, you have what are called blocked capillary channels with swelling. So when an area swells, the capillaries where oxygen and nutrition migrate across they, they they get blocked channels, thus not allow the swelling doesn't allow that to happen. Likewise, when we age, he believes that we get blocked capillary channels, and and he his he's still researching this, but he thinks that by doing the cupping therapy over some of these areas, you can help unblock those channels. Now, we wouldn't do cupping over a big swollen ankle. If later on after the swelling goes down, we might do cupping over that at that point. And you'd be surprised at the redness it kind of pulls out. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, going back to the ice, that is the reason we, we want to get the swelling down. So, so when you get an injury, ice is Ice first. is always best. Normally I, for? I would say for, if you're going to talk about heat, if when you get home at the end of the day, your neck's hurting, you're just achy, you got kind of tension, heat's kind of your best thing. Heat's going to be more soothing, help muscle relax. But when people have really bad neck or back pain, I tell them you can't go wrong with ice. Ice and it went in doubt. Ice, that's kind of a basic before rule of thumb. Heat. Ice before yep. heat. Okay, so you got a swelling, you do ice. You got a discomfort or a tight muscle. Tight muscle? Would you do ice or would you do heat? Tight muscle, I do heat. Like I, I got a, you know, like I got a catch back here. Yeah, I do, back. do heat. You do I heat. do heat. And now, if you're if that catch is like a stabbing pain, it's just miserable to you. Ice will help numb the pain so to speak it'll it'll and i tell people that all the time you know, if, if you got really bad back pain it's just killing you then go ahead and ice it because it'll numb it up and you'll feel better now once it warms back up you're gonna you're gonna feel it again so why are you doing your own business and not working for somebody else i i worked for a big company for 11 years and i'm grateful for that I, I, I'm very grateful for the time I spent. I, I worked my way up. I got to the point where I was running 55 clinics. But it got to a point where I think I said, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to 
do my own jump time. out of the plane and throw my shoot up. I hope my shoot up. Ready to climb the top of that mountain. <laughs> I just ready. don't know how I, I'm going to get there. I see, right? I see the mountain. So I decided in really the end of 2006, but I opened my practice, just me and a front desk girl. In 2007, February of 2007, spent my, co- my kids' college money, took it all out of the bank, dumped it in there, took a big leap of faith. I mean, I knew I could do it. I mean, I knew I had the skills. I knew I had the connections. It's just a matter of just doing it. And I just, you know, again, step by step, uh, you know, opened the clinic, got on the insurance contracts. The people started coming, kind of like right, the field so, of dreams. So how did you get your customers? How do you get your customers today? How do you? How do people come see you, find you, know about you? Well, prior to that, so when I opened my clinic, I had a, I had a good base of physicians who knew me and trusted me. From the other company. Yeah, for, yeah. and so when I left, of course, they still had that habit of, oh, you got to go there, go there. But over time, they, oh, yeah, Matt started his own thing, and they, they, they started coming. So that's how that started. Now, on a go-forward basis these days, I don't have a marketing person that I pay to take cookies to a doctor and say, hey, send us some patients. I just don't do that. And I go to a new doctor and say, hey, we're, we're champion over here, and here's some cookies. Send us a few patients. You'll love us. So I don't, I don't have that luxury of paying a marketing person like some of these big companies do. So most of ours is word of mouth. And it, it's, it works great. It happens all the time. I'll have a new patient come in and says, you know, my neighbor, they saw you and, and they told me to come to you. Or they'll, a patient will go to the doctor and the doctor will want to send them to therapy. And they say, well, hold on. I want to go to this champion place because my, you know, my, my son went there or my dad went there and I want to go there. And that's... Phenomenal marketing because when that patient goes back to that doctor who's been sending patients to a corporate place, and they say, "Hey, this is it. This is where you. This, this is it. more like home. Yeah, this is the place where you go. Then that's that's the best marketing I could ever have is when a patient goes back to a doctor, especially when a patient's had a bad experience somewhere else, and the doctor then they sends them to us, and that patient goes back and says, oh, no." This is this is it right here. So, so how do you work? How do you price things? Because some of that stuff's what the insurance will pay you. Do you get more than what the insurance paid? I mean, how does that work in the healthcare world? Where, I mean, can you just tell them, hey, that's what our fee is, or do you just have to accept what their will their insurance pays? How do you work that out? We um, oh, oh, probably ninety, if not more, percent of it is based on insurance contracts. So. My insurance contract and anybody else's, it's pretty standard across. Like my so you re- have to go work a contract with a... I would say work it, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> they it's, tell you they what... They tell you what... So Blue Cross Blue Shield, essentially what I'm getting paid by Blue Cross Blue Shield is what so-and-so down the street's getting paid. United Healthcare, same thing. It's, it's, it's Do you pl- have to sign up with those people? You do. You sign up and uh, and you get, you, you get on a contract with them. A lot of... Places now the contracts are the uh, they're, they're closed. So a lot of insurance companies have closed their regions, so they're not looking for any other therapy places. So a new guy can't get on their contract. Not real easy. On what something. happens if somebody comes in and you don't have a contract with their person? Well, that rarely happens because we're on almost all insurances, okay. but there are some that we're not. Um, and in those cases, we have a like a self pay rate. Mm-hmm. Which we we we've kept our self pay rate below kind of a standard a, a general standard because for one I want to you know I'm not a big corporate and I don't have to pay the VPs and the presidents and the CEOs and all that so I don't need to charge that so we'll we'll give that benefit back to the patient because you know you don't have to pay that head. so you guy come comes in paying cash does he get the same deal or better deal well he'll get he'll get our deal which is better than other places you know we're going to be uh, at, a, at a at a rate that's that's so is so much better than other places and, and and i tell people you know we may not be on your insurance plan you might even could take your receipt and turn it into your insurance plan they may pay you back i don't know but <laughs> uh but it is it's it's a lesser rate than what you'd pay if you were paying straight if it was straight out you paid everything on the bill it's a lot less than that so when you were growing your business and even now to keep your business going, are you 
a member of any other organizations? Do you do the chambers or the rotaries? Do you do mailers to your customer list? What anything at all? We that? don't. We don't do any mailers. Um, we. I did the Forsyth Chamber for a year or two, and it got hard for me with my schedule. I have a son that you know that plays travel hockey, or well, he plays college hockey now. But he was traveling all the time. My daughter was in college. You know, we were always going to her stuff. She had soccer games, college stuff. So it got hard for me to do that. And I wasn't really getting any bang for my buck. I think now that things are calming down, I'll get back involved with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and, and here recently, I'm trying to get more involved with uh, media and things like that. So we're, we're kind of... I'm, I'm trying to get up to speed. I'm trying to get... Uh, I'm old school. I'm trying to get new school. <laughs> So, but you haven't, I mean, but what's changed about that? What's making you think I need to get up to speed? I mean, well, I think healthcare in general is changing. And so one thing we're trying to do is we're trying to have more, like, for example, we have a Titles Performance Institute certified guy at my clinic who you can come in as a golfer and he'll analyze your flexibility, your strength, your swing, and he'll put together stretches and strengthening things to help your longevity of play in the golf. He's not going to make your. He's not going to guarantee your drive is going to be further, but that's one thing that we've added on. Keep your back from going yeah. out or whatever. Yeah, exactly. We have we we've invested in what's called an anti gravity treadmill where we can get runners in and they can run at like half their body weight. So we're 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 trying to we're trying to package a, a go beyond just your normal like the hyperbaric mm -hmm. chamber. Trying to do things a little bit more broad. Mm -hmm. Because I think what I'm afraid is going to happen is over time, physical therapy is going to start getting carved out by some of these insurance companies. So I'm trying to do things now to be proactive on, okay, we need to start showing the world what we have and what we can do. Right. And, and that's where we're at. And we've got to, I've never really had to do that, but I think now, you know, I've really got to get on this platform and, and, and show people. To continue growing your business. Exactly. Yeah. What about product knowledge? I mean, what do you do to learn about what the new stuff is? What do you do about your staff learning new stuff? How do y'all handle that? To, and how important is that? As far as product knowledge, most of that is I try to keep my ear to the track. Like, for example, this, alt, this Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill. That's something I've been kind of watching for a while. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not going to initially jump in on that. I want to see, you know, okay, how are they, are they getting repaired every six months? You know, I'm not buying something I've got to get fixed all the time, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm keeping my ear to the track on different products and, and, and seeing how we can incorporate that into our, our daily business with some of our patients. Um, so, it's, you know, that's, that's kind of what we do with products. As far as training our staff, the Georgia board, not only Georgia board, but across the nation, every state, requires us to have continuing education. So our clinicians, I, I encourage them to, okay, look at what you want to learn more about. And let's, let me, then I'll pay for you to go get educated on that. Do you wait on them to ask you what they want to learn about? Or do you suggest to them that they need to go? We, we talk about it. We'll, we'll talk about it. And I've, and like, I have a, a, a gal right now that's like her son at a young age came up with diabetes. And so she was real interested in learning more about, and she has learned a lot about this, about managing diabetes. So we talked about it one day and she, and she said, you know, there's a program where you can, you can get certified where then we can see patients and we can help them manage their levels through exercise and help them learn how to deal with this better. Mm -hmm. And I told her, I said, well, let's do it. Let's get you certified and let's make that your baby. And that's what she does. And it's so that's another thing. When I talked about packages that we have, that's yeah. another one we're trying to say, hey, we want to help educate some Do people. Do people even know that? I mean, that's awesome. Well, they, that's part of what you need to figure out how to get that. Exactly. Out. And we're and it's and it's a growing business. It's for that one we've got we're trying to get to some of these doctors too and say, Hey, we're over here and this is we can help your patients. Because that's not your typical physical therapy. You know, that's a yeah. I mean, yes, it's physical, but it's it's also it's your it's your internal system, right? Kind of different stuff. 
So what's the picture you paint for people when they ask you what you do or you're talking to a doctor and you're trying to explain to him, you know, what's unique about your particular business? If, do you have, I call it a picture, you know, you need to kind of give it to them in a way they can see it. You can't just say, well, we're the best mortgage company in town or we're the best physical therapist. What, do you have a story or how do you relate that to people? I think the, the, the best picture that I can paint for people or physicians is that we're we're kind of like a family operation. You know, we're gonna we're gonna treat you like family. We're gonna treat your patients like family. We're gonna, you know, they're not just a number. Um, you know, that maybe it's a picture. If you had to actually paint a picture, it's maybe us sitting up there on the front porch in a swing, <laughs> having some iced tea, ha- having some iced tea, doing <laughs> some, some leg exercises, <laughs> doing some leg exercises, and that's probably it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's nothing. It's not it's not brain surgery. And I, and I kid about I kid this with patients all the time too. I think this is a kind of a, a picture too. And I don't know how you could how people picture this in their own mind, but I'll kid with them. I say, "Come on now, you got you got to do ten more. This isn't second place physical therapy. It's champion." Oh man! So I don't know if you awesome. I don't know if you have a picture of a oh someone with a gold medal around their oh neck instead God. of a silver medal, but that's it, dude. You got to wear that out, right? You you got to do that with everybody. That's fantastic. Yep, I tell I from say, a marketing on. standpoint, that is this is not second place. Physical therapy, it's for it's champion oh physical god. therapy. Oh my god, the other guys are second. They're place. second yeah, place because you know champion. what? Because we're pushing for number one. We're not. So here that's to, your buzz, right? You can say we're yeah. champions. We're not second place. And 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 that's that's why we get. <laughs> we'll get physicians that send their neighbor to us. We'll get physicians that send the pro athlete to us. You know, we'll get. And, you know, and we're just hey, that pro athlete's gonna come in and well, hey, welcome a champion. We're going there's Mabel over there. Get to know her because you're on the table next to Mabel. <laughs> so the 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 pros. Why do you think you got pro athletes coming to see you? Well, a lot of pro athletes, obviously in season or even out of season, especially locally here that live local, they're gonna get they're gonna get their therapy by their near their house. Yeah, well, that, by their trainers, they're gonna want. They're going to want to go, and that's understandable. But the ones that are that are that are outside the you know they're they're retired from the pros, or maybe they live here and they but they play in Houston. Uh, some of these doctors will say, hey, you know, go over and see Matt. Uh, it's you know it's they're going to do you right. They have all the equipment. Does that build on itself? If one oh, pro yeah. comes and tells another pro. It does absolutely. In fact, a funny story. This is this goes back to my corporate days. So years ago, I just happened to acquire a patient. I knew nothing about him other than he hurt his back, and I'm not going to give any names. But he ended up telling me one day that he couldn't come to therapy on Monday because he was had to go do a show. And I was like, a show? Okay. And he's like, and he promised me that he's not going to do anything crazy, but rappel down from the ceiling. I'm like, I said, what are you talking about? And he goes on to tell me that, he, well, it's pro wrestling Monday night, and it's a thing. And I'm like, what? So I haven't watched pro wrestling since I was a kid right there in Roswell, Georgia, on, on uh, Channel 17. And I tune in, and lo and behold, there he is. Coming out of the ceiling. Coming out of the ceiling. So I get done doing therapy on him, and a, a while later, I'll sh- another one shows up on my doorstep. One of these well-known pro wrestlers that everybody would know. And then another one that everybody would know if I mentioned their names. And so all of a sudden, this wrestling organization that's on TV, they go to our corporate office and they say, hey, we want y'all to do our sports medicine. And everybody looks around the room and they said, well, what, do we know anybody? And they said, hey, that there's a guy over in Georgia, Matt Foltz. He treats all those guys. Next thing you know, I'm in charge of all that. I'm, I got a guy that works for me that travels with him all around the nation. Local, Today? No, this has been years ago. Then when they'd come to town, I'd go backstage and be back there powwowing around. And I'd take doctors. I'd take doctors with me to the shows. Because I had to have a physician at the shows, but it's it's just kind of crazy how what you said it's it one thing leads to the next and it kind of it leapfrogs and 
And that's why I said I'm grateful for those days when I did that yeah. stuff because I, I had a lot of stuff that fell in my lap that was just magnificent. But, you know, I think when I say step by step, you have to be there to be in the game. You have to take that step to be in the game. You have to be available and say, yeah, I'll do that. But is wrestling fake or not? Let's just say it's, <laughs> it, as far as the, the, uh, the athleticism <laughs> and the true grit, it's real. These yeah. guys get pounded and they get beat up, and we're it's looking, like football without pads. Isn't they it? get, but do they know who's going to win at the end? Yeah, eh, probably. <laughs> they got. Do they, they know what moves they're going to do? You think? Well, let's just I think they know what they're doing. They <laughs> they know what's coming next. They practice. They they, they got an idea. I yeah. love it. I love it. All right, so you know the last book I wrote is on how you think. You know how, how what's your process and um, processing stuff. And I believe that highly successful people have more positive thoughts than those that aren't as successful. Do you have a tape that you, I call it a tape, do you have little sayings that you think about in certain times or, or how do you talk to yourself that might get help somebody else and maybe change the way they're thinking? Well, I, I try not to talk to myself out loud in public. For one. <laughs> <laughs> but well, Donald Trump does. He yeah, talks yeah, out. He loud. does. Uh, I think as far as a, a tape that I might play in my head is you know, especially every day I, I'll get up and I'll you know I'll know it's a new day. Whatever whatever was what didn't go exactly right, you know that's behind me, mm -hmm. and because it's real easy. Um, I say in my business, it, because I'm dealing with people, you know, sometimes it's it's hard. Sometimes you second guess, you know, how this person's not getting better. You know, am I, am I not doing all the right things, or am I not am I not being my best? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes that kind of starts it, it gets in your head, and so I think you have to kind of say, you know what, I, I am doing my best, and I, I know I trust myself, and I trust my skills, and I trust my people, I trust my business. And so I think that's, if I had to say there's any tape that I play in my head, is just reconfirming to myself that I, that, that I, that I, that, yourself. Yeah, that I know what I'm doing, that I'm doing it right, and that I'm helping the people who work for me, and we're, 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 we're heading down the right path. And I think I have to always remind myself that because, you know, I think sometimes people can, especially in a medical field, can start getting in their head that they're a poser. There's a poser, what's called a posers, mm -hmm. where they think, hey, am I really who I say I am? Or am I yeah. really, what? I, am I doing yeah. what I, am I right? Yeah. So I think every day I, I, I do that. I, I, I think about my patients as I drive into work every day and I think, okay, who do I got on docket today? And what do we need to do differently? You know, what's, uh, and then I, so I do that every day. And I think by doing that, it helps me stay focused on that positive. That's beautiful. Now, what about these pro athletes? Can you tell that they have different conversations or how they carry themselves and how they think? Can you see that? Have you ever picked up on any of that? Well, yeah, I think for pro athletes, the biggest thing that they have is confidence. You know, their confidence is, you know, they're, you know, you can just tell by the way they hold themselves when they come in and they're, and, and I think that's what, probably has has made them get to that level. Is you know, there's a lot of great athletes out there, but these ones that are confident in what they can do, that's what I, I, I see these guys. And uh you know, they're not coming in, dragging they, in, being like, oh poor, I'm not gonna get better. My arm's so bad. I'm you know, they're they're not. They're confident, hey, let's get it done. I want yeah, I'm yeah, gonna I'm, get better. I'm let's gonna get, get here, done. I'm getting better. That's right. This it this is a champion, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any fear of failure? Do you feel like your business could crash or people could leave you? Or I mean, or when you decided, have you decided that maybe I'm going to open another location? I mean, how do you handle all that stuff that I could fail? I never really had a fear of failure up until COVID. When COVID hit, I really got really worried that you know, because for one, I wanted to protect my patients. I wanted to protect my employees. And I wanted to protect me and my family and my mm -hmm. business. I didn't want to I didn't want to go out of business, but I didn't want to lay people off. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to put, you know, I, we still needed to see patients because that's our revenue, but we didn't want to put them at risk. 
So that was a really difficult time for me. I thought, you know, this is, I mean, I really struggled with that. I thought, you know, what do we got to do? So we took measures, every possible measure, and I didn't lay off a single employee. I did every, you know, they all got paychecks. And, you know, and I just trusted that the process would work. And, and it did. But you were able to stay open, right? You were the type of business you could stay open. Yeah, we stayed open only to see patients that needed therapy. I told, you know, I told the grandpa that couldn't play golf because his back hurt. Well, just stay home and don't play golf and put ice on it, right? And we'll get to you here in a bit. And so we, we had to put, so our, our business dropped about probably 80, 70%. Oh, which is a lot, oh. a lot of business. And, oh. um, but fortunately, I had a fellow we know, David mm. Mitchler, he called me, said, hey, have you thought about this payroll protection? I said, David, I've been talking to my bank. I've been talking to people and nobody's coming around. Nobody, I'm just left high and dry. I don't know what to do. And he says, you need to call this fellow down here at this bank down here and call him. And luckily my wife also knew him because she's worked for an attorney and they knew him. And I called him and he said, I'm going to shoot you the applications. And I got it in. I got in last day. <laughs> and he got me in and pushed it through. And, that and it was you. like a miracle. If it wasn't for that, I would have had, yeah. So oh that was big. That was a big deal for us. So what do you think is the reason why you're on the planet? What's your purpose being here? Oh, hang on a second. I have a drink of water after that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh well, I think everybody struggles with what they're meant to do in life. And I think I figured out through sports that I enjoyed working with people in the sports medicine aspect. So I think for one, I think I was born to be, I, I wouldn't call it a healer, but I'm born to be a physical therapist. I think I'm here to do that. And I think I'm, I was born to raise kids and help them do the best in their life they can. And and that, speaking of fa fear of failure, that's one of my biggest ones is fear of failing as a dad, not teaching your kids everything they need to know to be a productive prepared. adult. Yeah, yeah, prepared. And especially these days when things change every two months mm -hmm. in the parenting book. So are all years out of high school? My daughter is, uh, she graduated from Georgia, graduated from Georgia uh, two years ago, and she's going to PA school, physician assistant school uh, at Emory, my alma mater too, both schools, Georgia and Emory. My son, he's a uh, Division I hockey player at Liberty University, so he's he's cruising down that path. He wants to be a physical therapist, so I'm like, do it. You can come on in, work right here, and I'll leave. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> That's my plan. That's your plan. So I got to keep him focused. That's awesome. Well, everybody, we uh, we want to thank Matt for being here with us today. I hope you learned a little something about physical therapy. And if you know, if you got some uh, some bones and some muscles and some ligaments and tendons that need some taken care of, Matt's a man. And uh, he's like you said, he's got an office in Alpharetta and coming and. Um, we really appreciate you being here, Matt, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Doug, for being here with another edition of Beach Talks.